Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive the good news of your love anew this day. Amen. A central part of the Christian faith is intimate connection with God and prayer. The chosen Bible verses illustrate the process underlying our life of prayer. First in Jeremiah 29, 12, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. From Matthew 6, verse seven, and when you pray, don't babble on and on like the pagans who think God will hear them better if they talk a lot. In Romans 8, verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. And Philippians, uh, Philippians 4, 7, then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. I think I have the technology master now. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Um, grateful for the help we've had in leading worship. Um, will you join me in a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be useful to God's intentions for the world. Amen. Oh, there are so many ways to pray. Out loud, silently, singing, speaking in tongues, crossing oneself, fingering beads, kneeling forehead to the floor, chanting to drums, uh, spinning like a dervish, spinning a prayer wheel, and I'm sure that isn't a complete list. And some prayers are even funny. Like this one. Dear Lord, as your humble servant, let me prove to you that winning the lottery won't change me. <laughs> Dear God, my prayer for 2023 is for a fat bank account and a thin body. Please don't mix them up like you did last year. <laughs> now I could evaluate all these various forms of prayer, good, bad, or indifference. And some of you who know me know that I do like to question and poke fun and um, even argue. <laughs> And any natural skills I have were honed by four years of philosophy in college and four years of theology in seminary. But at my age, 80 years old, I've gotten my money's worth of that training. <laughs> and so I don't have to argue about prayer today. Although I do have to say that there are two kinds of prayer that I find unacceptable. The first is prayers for the harm of anyone, 
even the worst criminals. Because Jesus taught, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the second kind of prayers I find unacceptable would be prayers that seek to give God's approval to government or religious behavior that is self-seeking or discriminating by nation, race, gender, or religion. So today, rather than arguing, I'm just gonna be about sharing what prayer has come to mean to me and one idea about how I think it might work. In 1988 and 89, I was uh, overeating big time. Breakfast, second breakfast, um, about 10, then a full lunch at noon, hamburger and fries as a snack, about three, dinner, and then snacks all evening while I watched TV. I gained 100 pounds and was depressed. When I finally agreed to 28-day inpatient treatment at Rogers Hospital, I encountered the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That was a well-known prayer to many people, especially in the, in the addiction community. <clears throat> but it was new to me. But it has become an underlying principle of my understanding of prayer. Now, as a pastor, while I was overeating, I had success helping other people find God's power in prayer. But I hadn't found it for myself. I prayed for God to take away my cravings for food and I guess it's no surprise to you, no magic happened. My wallet was not suddenly empty. My car didn't run out of gas on the way to the fast food place. Hardee's, my favorite binge place, um, wasn't mysteriously closed because of electrical problems. I found out that in treatment and even after treatment, when I got feeling sorry for myself or feeling deprived, only if I was willing to give up the short-term pleasure that I knew was waiting for me in that snack, did I have the power from outside myself to resist and to make better choices about how to deal with my feelings. Puzzling. How is it that without my willingness, prayer didn't seem to work? If God is all loving, if God is all knowing about the future, and if God is all powerful, why didn't God end my suffering and my limitations? Or more importantly, why didn't God end the terror and the warfare and all manners of evil in our world when we faithfully prayed for such things to happen? So how does prayer work? Well, the New Testament Bible does not claim that God will protect us from all peril, only that God will be with us. As it was written in Romans 8.28, in everything, God works for good with those who love God and who are called according to God's purposes. Notice, God works in everything, not from outside. God works for us and with us. Now that is a no small reality to wrap your mind around. My understanding of how prayer works is mostly based on my experience with the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead and the uh, ordained ministers and theologians, John Cobb Jr. and Marjorie Hewitt Sakaki. So let's talk a minute about how reality works in, under, in order to understand prayer. The philosopher Whitehead thought that reality was always changing. 
not a static world of God's predetermined rules and outcomes, but a changing one. And we certainly can identify with that understanding. We live in a fast changing world. Forms of travel, means of communication, medical discoveries, and even forms of government where people elect their leaders all have been changes within my lifetime and yours that were scarcely imagined in biblical times. Now, Whitehead created in great detail and with special terms that he invented to explain how reality works. And lucky for you, I'm not going to teach that to you today. <laughs> it was complicated, so much so that I barely could get through my senior paper on evaluate, evaluating his theology because it was so hard to learn the language. No, today I'm going to give you a kind of a simplified, I guess I'm showing my age, Reader's Digest summary of um, what Whitehead had to say. He said, reality is made up of units of energy and experience that renew themselves to become the future. So the past is alive and potent in the present, but the past does not completely predict the future. There's always possibility for evolution and change. For in reality is a force, an intention is what Whitehead called it, seeking the fullest measure possible of love, truth, and beauty. Now, Whitehead didn't call it God, but he had no problem with others calling that intention God. And as part of reality, Whitehead also thought that we have such an intention in ourselves too, a built-in drive to maximize truth and love and beauty. The theologian John Cobb said that prayer is the vehicle of those influencing those intentions. Prayer is a source of energy and then action that fuels that push to the future. God offers possibilities that would lead to the new life we need. However, as Deuteronomy made it clear in its accurate description of how God presents these possibilities, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that your descendants may live. It's been a common human experience to understand that God has a vested interest in what we decide, but does not maybe even cannot, force us into doing anything. I love the way John Cobb describes it. God lures, urges, and persuades. We decide. As for, <clears throat> as for praying about healing, I want to share the thoughts of Marjorie Hewitt Sakaki. She's a retired professor of theology from Claremont in California and an ordained Church of Christ pastor. And I'm going to read an extensive quote from her because she says so well what I have come to believe about the nature of praying, especially praying for healing. Our prayers make a difference in what God can do. Prayers for healing, even when the illness in question is thought to seem terminal, sometimes contribute to a reversal towards health for the one for whom we pray. And in those happy cases, God can combine the divine resources 
with those of the person's own and with the communities of the personal and professional cares that are surrounding the ill person. Recovery occurs and those who prayed in agony pray now in rejoicing for the renewed health of the one they love. But God alone knows when such reversal is and is not possible in identified terminal cases. Thus, to give prayers for healing in the context of terminal illness, it is to pray for the health that is possible, whether that be total recovery, partial recovery, or the recovery of those who mourn. In releasing such prayers to God, we look for and are thankful for the forms of healing that can be and are given." End quote. So I've come to believe that God doesn't have to be all-knowing, just know more possibilities than we do. God doesn't have to be all-powerful, just have enough power to move God's intentions into the next moments of reality. And I have come to believe when we pray, aligning ourselves to God's intentions, adding our intentions with God's, we are tapping into and adding to the strongest power for good changes in all the universe. To close, I want to share with you a poem I found on the internet. Dear Lord, so far, I'm doing all right today. Today, I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, <clears throat> I have not whined, complained, cursed, or eaten any chocolate. I have charged nothing on my credit card. But I will be getting out of bed in a minute, and then I think I will really need your help. <laughs> Amen.